Sergeant, I appreciate you taking the time. Thanks so much. My pleasure, sir. Happy to be here. Now, I'd like to begin talking about your background in law enforcement, your career. Talk to me about the trajectory of your career. So in a nutshell, right out of high school, I went into the military for three years in the infantry. And when I did get out of that, um, didn't, didn't have any direction. So I was still looking for, for what I wanted to do. Well, I got into state corrections and out in California, California Department of Corrections. So I worked at Soledad Prison for one year. And then a lot of people have heard of San Quentin. Well, I worked there for two years when a guy I was working with said, hey, I'm going out for the highway patrol. Come on with me. That that buddy thing. So it, it took me a while to really think about this because I thought, you know, those, those guys are squared away. I don't know if I could do this. But uh, pushed and pushed and pushed, passed all the tests, took me a year and a half to get in. And I made it. So I spent the next 23 years with the Highway Patrol, and I worked a lot on the Golden Gate Bridge. And you alluded to it. How did you get that nickname, the Guardian of the Golden Bridge? Golden Gate Bridge, I'm sorry. I had done a, a couple of articles with other folks. Uh, one was the New Yorker years and years ago. And then Yahoo News caught on to it back in around 2012, something around there. And they wanted to do a, uh, a kind of a mini show about this. Well, I, I was a sergeant at the time, and I wanted to kind of pawn it off onto the officers who worked down there, because now I'm kind of stuck in an office most of the time. But they wanted me, so I thought it was just going to be a 30-minute interview, no big deal. Well, we wound up spending about six hours with these folks from Yahoo News, and we went down to the bridge, GoPros on my motorcycle, and just a very, very long time, and had no idea about it just kind of forgot about it um in december of that year it aired and then i started getting all sorts of calls from folks and letters so that's where they they came up with this guardian of the golden gate and it stuck tell me about your work uh at the golden gate bridge why was that something that stuck the bridge is the number one spot in the united states for loss of life to suicide. Now I say that that's going to, to come to an end here pretty quick because there is a suicide barrier going up on that bridge as we speak. I think it's about 75, 80% done. But at the time, it was the number one spot in the United States. I had no idea. I grew up in Marin County and Marin County connects to San Francisco via the Golden Gate Bridge. So I was wondering why people didn't want to work down there so much. I found out really fast. It's the number of people contemplating suicide. And I would handle four to six cases a month. And I had no training in this. I didn't know what to do, what to say. Am I going to say the wrong thing if they jump? You know, am I responsible? It was a really crappy way of putting someone down there to work, you know, without any training. Now, the word on the street is that you've talked hundreds of folks out of suicide. Now, this may be a broad question. What techniques that you've utilized over the years, what approaches have been deemed most effective in your view? Really trying to listen to understand what they're going through, trying to put myself in their shoes. And when I walk up on someone, I don't just walk all the way up. If they're standing over this four and a half foot or four foot pedestrian rail, I don't just walk up and start talking. I stay back. I would just raise my hand up open palm and say, hi, I'm Kevin. Is it all right if I come up and talk with you for a while? So I'm not Sergeant Kevin Briggs, California Highway Patrol. Who cares at that point? This is not a, a time or place for that. I just want them to know it's another human being that wants to come up and talk with them. And then really, if they'll open up just to listen. And a big thing is, is not to try to fix anything, just to be there for them. Now, how long did it take you to own these techniques and to kind of refine these approaches? Um, it must have been a nerve-wracking process in the beginning, considering you're dealing with such sensitive issues. It really was. Um, it took uh, years and years in the making. And I'm still, when I talk to negotiators and travel around, I'm still trying to find better ways of doing it. So... It, it's a work in progress. It still is. But, you know, I found some things that that tend to help. I lost just a couple of people um, 
you know, and that's a tragedy and it's horrible in, in and of itself. But I think over the years, and I worked on the bridge for about 10 years, I handled four to six cases a month, and that's a lot of people. So I would ask the people afterwards, what did I do that helped the situation? And what did I do that maybe wasn't so good? So I'm learning off the backs of them. And for negotiators, if you go into this with an ego, you are not going to do well because it is not about us. It is always about the individual. How important is patience, right? It seems that so much of this process is talking somebody through something, putting yourself in somebody else's shoes. Is this something for everyone? Can everyone learn these techniques? Or is it something that you really have to have a predisposition towards at the outset? I think you have to be mature enough to accept that mental illness if these folks are suffering from it, which most of them are, whether diagnosed or not, that it is true and in fact uh, you know, a cause of a lot of things and what happens out there. So patience is huge. You have to have patience. You have to have the empathy and you have to want to do this job. It is not just another day on the beat, go and handle it and and then just, you know, work your way around it, killing at eight hours or 12 hours and going home. You have to want to do this and really be there for an individual. Uh, you kind of get in this bubble to where it's just you and that person and nothing else exists. And that's what I try to do to really understand what they're going through. Not that I can fix it, but I can certainly be there as a sounding board for that individual. So you have to come in with these traits. And I think that really, really helps everything else we do, what we say and, and normalization and validations and things that's help that helps, but you have to come into this with empathy and try to understand what is going on with someone. Talk to me about some of your most impactful experiences, the cases that stuck out over time, things that you can look back at years and decades later and say, that really changed me. That really had an impact. Well, there'll be one that I lost, uh, a gentleman named Jason Garber out of New Jersey, that he was 32 years old. Um, there's this I-beam on the other side of the rail that he was sitting on. And we spoke to him for about an hour. And I was working with a Golden Gate Bridge security guard. And this gentleman, usually we would take over, but this guy's actually really good. So I did a lot of the listening and, and interjected now and again. But Mr. Garber, was he was just a genius. But he was suffering from mental illness, felt the doctors did not diagnose him right. He was just fed up with the entire system and was struggling. Um, he had put out an email to friends and family about the time he thought he would be on the bridge and that happened and he had his phone in his hands with him. He would look at it, he's getting all sorts of calls and messages and sometimes he would, <clears throat> excuse me, he would laugh, he would cry and it was a very, very emotional. But he said, you know, emotionally, I should be over with you guys. But logically, I need to be down there. And he pointed to the water, which is about 220 feet below. So we stayed there with him and just trying to, to talk with him, break this barrier of him wanting to go. But finally, you know, he said, do you guys know the story of Pandora's box? And we said we did. Pandora had a box that was given to her by Zeus. And she was told never, ever, ever to open this box. Well, of course, one day she does, and out flies all sorts of evils against man. The only thing good in the box is hope. Well, Jason says, when I open the box, hope is the greatest evil. Very, very profound. And he looked just straight ahead, and I see a tear come down his right eye. He leans to his right, and he's gone. So... That one, that one was, uh, he, you know, it just a, a really neat kid that was lost. Um, and we had three suicides that day. So, you know, it starts with us seeing this. It starts with the people who were down the Coast Guard who actually pick up the bodies. And then it just, it's a tsunami out to the families. Uh, it's just horrible to see this. So whatever I can learn to help others to do this type of work, and to talk to folks 
who may be suicidal into not going through with that act. You know, I think we we have a lot of work to do with this. We're losing over 48,000 people a year just in this country alone. What can law enforcement do? What can the various law enforcement agencies around the country do in terms of training officers for this and gaining a specialization in this area to help prevent folks from going down this road? I think everybody should be trained in CIT, and a lot of officers are now. It's crisis intervention team training, CIT. After that, if you're interested in it, maybe go on to be a negotiator, and they have a lot of different negotiator schools. Uh, I did this, but I didn't do it for years. Um, it wasn't until way later in my life when I went through the FBI crisis negotiators course, and, and it was wonderful. It was I learned a lot something like this, or at least have somebody come in who talks about this, but you have to want to do this too. And we know with uh, out there on the streets, you know, mental illness calls are becoming more and more frequent. So we need people trained in how to approach, how to talk, what to do with these folks. Now, once you left government service, you went into essentially independent suicide prevention efforts. Why did you do that and how did you do that? So I was in government service 29 years. And uh, after the Yahoo News segment, I got a lot of calls to come out and speak and I was asked to do a TED talk. So I did all of this um, and I was getting so many calls to come out and talk to folks. The highway patrol kind of shut me down. For, for whatever reason, I don't know. I kind of think it's this low, you know, little lonely sergeant or lowly sergeant. And it wasn't a, a big upper management in, in the staff area. So I had just turned 50, which means I can get a retirement. I can get my full medical, which is, which is important. Uh, I took a chance and I had some good mentors. And I said, you know what? I may be working at a local coffee shop here in a bit, but I'm going to go out and I'm going to try this on my own. And not that working is in the coffee shop is bad because I, I go to them every day to try and study. So I took a chance and I created my own organization called Pivotal Points. And it's been 10 years. And I, I don't advertise, but I do 40 to 60 talks a year. It's all word of mouth. I've been out of country many times. Um, again, just asked yesterday to go to Australia to do some talks. So I've been very humble, very fortunate to be able to do this kind of work. It is a lot of work. I thought I did a lot of work and I was busy in the Highway Patrol. Uh, I, I spent a lot more time working these days than I ever did with the Highway Patrol. But I've met so many nice people. It has truly been a gift to me to be able to do this. You know, it's so funny. You're now essentially a businessman, right? And yes. I wonder what qualities translated your time in law enforcement, your time in the military, your time in doing, uh, engaging in suicide prevention efforts, which of those qualities translated into maintaining a successful business? I think all of that. And then talking to folks who are their own boss, what did they do? They said, you have to get up in the morning because that's only you doing it. You have to get up, you have to shower. And if you can't work at home, you know, go to a coffee shop if you're not going to get an office. So I work out of my house, but I do go to, to coffee shops quite a bit where I study. And it, it you know, because we get distractions in our home. So once I get out of here, it, it gives me uh, a lot easier of a time to study and look at things. But you, everything you do is, is on you. Uh, I've had some helpers in the past and I still, I have some great mentors, but it's not like going to work. You, you are it. If it doesn't get done, by you, it is not getting done. So self-motivation, um, you got to have that. You got to have that and drive forward. You'll have good times and bad times. Keep driving on. Surround yourself with good people. Where is society now as it relates to stigmatization of mental health illnesses? I think it's getting better. And I say this because when I speak at schools, high schools and such, they're paying attention. They want to learn about this. And I can tell you when I was in high school and I graduated a long time ago, 1981, 
I wouldn't probably didn't want to listen to a cop. And I certainly didn't want to hear about mental illness and suicides and things. Nowadays, it's amazing. Most of the time, the rooms are packed. And, and I'm not saying that egotistically. You know, this is not the Kevin Briggs show. It is about other people. And they want to come and they want to learn about their friend, more about themselves. What do we say? What do we not say? How can we help each other? So I think it's gotten a lot better. We have a long ways to go. But in my opinion, it has gotten a lot better to be able to talk about this. What do you think is the impact of social media and the expansion of the internet, right? Folks talk about these things cutting both ways, right? Social media clearly has an impact in a negative way on things like cyberbullying and the like. And then on the other hand, it is a forum, right, to where it's where to raise awareness and to connect folks that are struggling with these issues. Is it something that cuts both ways or is it something that hurts more than helps? I think it goes both ways. Personally, you have to watch what's on social media because a lot of it is trash. It really is. Do your homework. But it also gives you a chance to talk to folks like we are right now. You can do a Zoom with with a lot of different folks. You know, if we had um, where everybody had to stay in epidemic and all COVID. Well, we a lot of us didn't go out. So at least we could do something like this and have a connection, which is very, very important. Now we get the, the cyberbullying and all of that. Yes, that, that does come into play. So as long as we're watching what we're doing, and as long as we're explaining to our kids the power of the social media and what is out there and to be very careful with it, I think it's fine. I really do. How much of mental health is on parents? right, in educating their kids and raising their kids in the appropriate ways, in, I suppose, instilling confidence in their kids so that they perhaps wouldn't be as susceptible to certain things. How much of that is on parents? I think quite a bit. And it goes right along with the schools and the teachers, too. We need to install in kids. It's okay. You know, if you're having a bad day, all right, but this is going to pass. And I've just seen this too many times with kids is they are just looking five, six, seven years in the future. Whereas we are looking towards retirement and past that, that they think if they're being bullied and they get an F in the class or they didn't make a team, maybe their life is over. And that's when we see them up on the bridge. And most of the time, we don't even get a chance to speak with them. They come up and they just jump. They're not looking in the future because that frontal lobe isn't developed enough for reasoning up until around age 25, 26, something in that range. So... I think both, if we can get them at the school, the teachers, what is being taught and, and the personality of that teacher and the parents, it's up to us to make our kids rise up, to help them to rise up and see what is good and, and what is bad and, you know, the beauty of everything around here. You know, you've spoken a bit about your complex connection to faith, to religion. Can you tell me a bit about that? Sure. Well, I grew up uh, in a Catholic school, and I still really have have deep ties with that. The only thing I wish they would have done is is taught me about other religions. They didn't back then. I would have loved to learn more about other religions, but it's a very personal thing, as everybody knows. Um, for me, it is daily for me that I pray, and. You know, not only for yourself, but for others. That's I think that's really the, the key to this is not wanting things all the time. I have everything I need. What are we doing for other people? Help me become better at talking, presenting, giving to other people. So it's a big part of our lives. It really, really is. You know, you mentioned schools a second ago. Is this something that is a geographic issue? In other words, do certain parts of the country deal with this better than other parts of the country? And if so, how and why? Now, this is just uh, my own personal observation. Most of my work is done in the Midwest and then some more on the East Coast. I think personally that they do a better job because they talk about this more. And it's not just me being allowed to come in, but when I talk to folks, they're easier to talk to. They sit down, they seem to have a lot of time. Whereas 
if you get in near one of the cities, and I'm about 40 minutes or so from San Francisco, these places, they're so busy trying to make a dollar. You know, it's, it's tough out here. It's so expensive that people don't a lot of times get the time to sit down and really chat and see how are you really doing and how is that other person really doing? Um, what I feel in the Midwest, I, I think they're doing a, a good job. Now, look, I'm not a political person. You don't seem to be a political person either from everything I've done. There seems to be, at least from what I see, such polarization, politically speaking, these days in the country. What impact do you think that has on mental health and the connections that folks are able to form among one another and between one another? I think the media has a huge play into this. Um, almost a dividing force instead of just reporting on this and giving us the news of our politicians, they almost will divide it because they'll pick and choose what clips they want to show. There is there. This is a, a big dividing, especially nowadays with what's going on with, with our people who are going to be running for president. Um, what we really find out and what we know, you know, we don't, we don't know. We can only perceive on what is given to us, the information, because most of us maybe don't go to the rallies and, and don't see these individuals who are running, but we take it with a grain of salt. That's all we can do is, is take it with a grain of salt and try to sit down at the table with other folks. If you're going to discuss it, bring your patience, bring your tolerance, are we going to fix anything at that table? To be honest with you, probably not. So why argue about it? You know, we can pass it. Oh, I didn't know that. Maybe learn some things from each other. But to have, I see people just blow up on things and get up and walk out. There's no need for that. So. What has your work in suicide prevention taught you about yourself? It has taught me to have greater patience, and uh, and it's still ongoing. I'm a, I'm a work in progress on that one. To be able to talk about the things that that have happened to me much easier. Um, you know, I've had I had testicular cancer in the army. I've had some some head traumas along the way on the motorcycles that I rode with the highway patrol. I had some very very severe abuse by a neighbor when I was eight to ten years old. Um, and that took me 40 years to talk about, but I finally did. And I found out, you know what? When I was working, I didn't lose my job. I didn't lose friends. I gained things. I'm, I'm getting to do this right now with you. I get to travel around the world and talk about these things and tell people it's okay. Not that what happened to you is not okay, but to talk about it, it is okay. What therapeutic approaches, and you're not a doctor, I know that. What therapeutic approaches... Have you seen work in folks that struggle with mental health, in folks that struggle with mental health to the point where they resort to possible suicide? A good support group. I go out to coffee when I'm home four days a week or so with a group of folks who had nothing to do with law enforcement, and they're all older than me, but we talk about everything, and nobody interrupts each other, and we take what people are saying. If you can find a good support group, to get you out of the house, because sometimes it's hard to get out of the house. I'm very much an introvert and have, have battled mental illness for quite some time. So when they call me or text me, Kevin, you're coming down for coffee, right? It forces me out of the house. And I see this with so many people. If we can get you out, then you're like, all right, everything's good now. Once, once we can step foot out that door. Pets is another one. I have two small dogs, never had small dogs in my life. I spend a lot of time with these little guys, and they are a blast. I love hanging out. There's no complaining, no nothing. They just want to be with you. So a good support group, pets, but you need to find out what works for you. Uh, going to the gym, although I don't go very often, that is important. And now they say instead of walking 10,000 steps a day, I've just read a report, 4,000 steps a day. So we can cut it down some. And... Uh, let's see. Oh, meditation. That's a big one that I took a class in transcendental meditation, TM, and it's really cool stuff. It works, but you have to put in the effort and the work to do it. That can really help folks too. You mentioned going to the gym. 
Is there a connection between physical and mental health? And if so, to what degree? I think so. Because when people, they, they go to the gym, for instance, or they go running or bicycling, whatever it is, you know, besides the chemicals that it's released, you feel better about yourself. You just, you just do. You're changing your body chemistry. You're changing things around. So that work really comes out to play and you do feel better. You feel more confident, but we have to sometimes push ourselves or get up earlier to do these things. When you look back at your life, you're still a relatively young guy. When you look back at your life, what moment do you hold as most dear? Uh, what accomplishment do you look at as most important? Most important? Well, of course, I would have to say my two boys. But, you know, just, just working along the way and surrounding yourself with good people, I think, really, really matters. Um, I don't say when I work up on the bridge that I saved anybody. I said that I helped people in a very dark time. So that is, is very, very gratifying in itself. I wish it didn't have to be. You know, and there's other people all, all around that do the same type of work that I do. So when I say Guardian of the Golden Gate, I'm really talking about all of them. And, and those folks, the moms at home who are talking to their kids who are struggling, you are a guardian also. We all have this in us to do this. So, you know, I'm proud of the work that I did and, and the things that I've done. So working up on the bridge, yes, that was that was really, really cool. You know, but my boys, that's a, a whole other thing. And then just just trying to establish myself in this business world. Say, look, I did this and I didn't have to advertise. The word got out. People want to hear more about this. So um there's been a, a number of things, and that's difficult for me because I, I usually don't talk about myself that in that way. What would you recommend to somebody who is struggling right now? Talk to somebody, see somebody, um, approach somebody that could help. What would you recommend? That's exactly what I would say. And, and if you need help, if you feel you're in crisis, it used to be the 1-800-273-TALK, the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline. Now it is 988. You can call that number and they can assist you. If it's a lot of uh, adolescents, they don't like to talk on the phone. My boys don't call me very often, but they'll text. There is a, a number out there now, 741-741. It's a crisis text line. They have that. So don't be afraid that you have to go through this alone. Okay, there is help out there and there is hope. So what does the future hold for you, right? Is it more appearances, traveling, speaking, writing? Is there something you have your eye on in particular? When things slow down enough, um, I would look at doing a podcast. And I have never been on your side of it. So I don't know if I would be any good at it or not. But I would like to give that a try. Yeah. Look, I really appreciate you taking the time to do this with me. Thank you um, for sharing all of your insight. Very much appreciated once again. Oh, my pleasure. Happy to do it.